In addition, we will be conducting an evaluation of this program. Please take a moment to scan the QR code. We will also provide it to you in the chat, chat link. We greatly appreciate your feedback as we continue to plan our events and providing service to our communities. At this time, I would like to introduce our chapter president, Madam President Paula Irvin. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Paula Irvin and I am the president of the New Haven Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated is a private not-for-profit organization founded on January 13, 1913, whose purpose is to provide assistance and support through established programs in local communities throughout the world. On October 3, 1959, the New Haven Alumni Chapter was chartered. So the New Haven Alumni Chapter, legacy of service to the greater New Haven area, has a focus in influence around our five point programmatic thrusts, economic development, educational development, political awareness and involvement, physical and mental health, and international awareness and involvement. So social action is a critical aspect of our political awareness and involvement thrust. We've probably seen it a lot and you've probably heard us say it a lot, but social action is what we do. So I encourage you to listen in, engage in on the conversation and have a good time tonight as we discuss the impact on COVID-19 in the classroom. We have some excited, exciting panelists to discuss and address any questions you may have. I encourage you to put those in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat if you have any questions as well as using the raise your hand feature, we can acknowledge you to ask your question aloud. So again, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Madam President. Our moderator for this evening is Sora Alexandria Lawrence. Sora Lawrence is an active social action committee member, the chair of our risk management committee and Delta Academy and GEMS. Sora Lawrence. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for being with us tonight. I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Ms. Keisha Red Hannings, assistant superintendent for instructional leadership of the New Haven Public Schools. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's so great to be amongst so many uh, friends and of course, Soros. I am Keisha Red Hannons, Assistant Superintendent for Instructional Leadership in New Haven Public Schools. Uh, prior to becoming Assistant Superintendent, I was a principal as well as Assistant Principal and Instructional Coach in New Haven Public Schools. However, my career began as a high school math teacher in DC public schools. Um, in addition to that, I am also a parent of two energetic and proud black boys that bring black boy joy every day um, to Hamden public schools. And I look forward to the conversation this evening. Oh, and absolutely, I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Thank you. Thank you. It is a pleasure to have you with us this evening, Soar Hennings. Next, we have Ms. Roxana Walker-Canton representing the Hampton Board of Education. Uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank uh, Delta uh, Sigma Theta uh, Sorority Incorporated for inviting me to sit on this panel. This is a, a conversation that is much needed. Um, I am a new Board of Ed, uh, a board of ed member in Hampton. This, I've been on it for a year. Uh, COVID, of course, cut some of that uh, well, I guess it's not really cut short, but it made us act in different kinds of ways. Um, I am an educator. I, I'm a university professor. I'm now teaching at the University of Florida, but I've been teaching at, I've taught at University, uh, Fairfield University, as well as Connecticut College. And um, I recently was a teacher for the, um, uh, for one of the programs here uh, uh, in New Haven, teaching students uh, that are in high school. Um, and let's see, I also own a, um, uh, a tutoring uh, business here in Hamden. Um, so I've been working with young people as well as college age students for a long time. Also uh, what I teach in the university is filmmaking. So I'm a filmmaker as well. I, my three children have, uh, have gone through the Hamden school system. Uh, two have graduated and uh, my youngest is a senior this year. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to be amongst you tonight. Thank you so much. Next, we have um, Dr. Tamiko Jackson MacArthur. She is a pediatrician and a former New Haven Health Commissioner and also a New Haven Board of Education member. Good evening, everyone. 
I am Tamiko Jackson MacArthur. I am a pediatrician here in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, I've been practicing for 22 years in New Haven. I am a community health advocate. I was a New Haven Health Commissioner for eight years before joining the New Haven Board of Education three years ago. I'm in my fourth year. I am um, chair of the governance committee. And um, I am also a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, um, 33 years and counting. Um, and I am just delighted to be here for this discussion tonight. And I have two wonderful children at 13 years old and they are, um, they are in eighth grade here in the New Haven Public School System. What a pleasure. Thank you for being with us this evening, Sora. We appreciate that. Next, we have um, Ms. Tracy Foskey. She is the founder and owner of Total Joy RU, also known as TJ, a autism foundation. We can't hear you, Tracy Foskey, you're muted. There we go. I'm sorry about that. Good evening, everyone. Sorry about that. I am the founder owner of Total Joy U Autism Foundation in New Haven, Connecticut. I am the proud mother of a 16-year-old son who's on the on the spectrum. Um, he's a student in New Haven Public Schools at New Haven High um, New Haven Academy. I'm also a social worker for the state of Connecticut. I've been in that field, working in the field for 21 years, and I am excited about being on this panel tonight. Thank you. We are super excited to have you with us this evening. Last but not least, we have Ms. Laquita Joyner McGraw. She is also a board member of Total Joy RU. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I'm Lakita Joyner McGraw. I'm actually a board member of Total Joy RU. Um, I actually have over 15 years experience teaching in higher education where I focus on um, business and communication. Um, but today I am representing Total Joy RU. I also have two boys ages seven and 10, no, seven and 11. And we are, my boys are actually in the North Haven uh, school system. Once again, thank you for the invite and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. We are super excited to have all of our panelists tonight. A wealth of knowledge. We are um, you know, we're ready to have this much needed conversation. So we're gonna just jump right on in and we're gonna start with our first polling question. All right, so for each polling question, we're gonna give about 30 seconds. So um, we're gonna quickly review and we're gonna move right along to the panelists. So the question is, how do you believe the, how do you believe, oh, sorry, I can't see it. How do you believe the largest impact on the COVID-19 in the classroom? So we have 64% answered disruption of, of school routines. We have 5% answered sitting remotely in hybrid learning. We have 18% who answered 
threat to public health and safety, and 3% answered other. Thank you. All right, so we are going to jump right on into our um, first question of the night. So the first question is pertaining to um, those who are employed working in the school system. So the first question is, we have been in COVID in the COVID-19 pandemic and schools were abruptly closed in the middle of March 2020. What effects have been made since the time to continue learning for students, staff, and to support families? And what are our plans to reopen safely? So I'll begin. Um, you know, that's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> as I look over 11 months, almost 12 months ago, um, you know, I, I was talking to the superintendent of our school system today, talking about when we first, March 13th, shut down, we initially just sent kids home with two weeks of work that were packets. Um, having no clue, no idea what we were actually embarking upon. Um, and it put us into, and I'll answer it kind of quickly, crisis teaching and crisis leading. Mm -hmm. um, no one has ever taught through a pandemic. That's not how our schooling has informed us to be. Um, but with the help of, and Dr. MacArthur Jackson is on, with the help of our Board of Ed um, and the school system, we were able to do the best we can given the limitations that were put before us. We supported our teachers through staff development. Um, we also had a goal of becoming one-to-one -one in our district, um, addressing the digital divide. Um, we knew that uh, inequitable funding existed for a very long time. Um, it has been exasperated by this pandemic and now others are aware of uh, the, the inequitable conditions that our children have been um, living in and asked to thrive in, right? Um, so we were able to make the, the, um, the devices one-to-one -one. for our families. We've held several family academies to help them even learn how to navigate through a Chromebook, how to, how to log on to Google Classroom, how to check their child's progress in a remote environment. And in the same time, uh, we were pushed uh, by our community to ensure that our buildings were safe um, and inspect our ventilation systems um, within all 41 of our schools. Um, in New Haven Public Schools in particular, I am very confident in our schools because I know we have gone above and beyond um, what other school systems have done. Um, and we've ensured, uh, I, I, I didn't know anything about MERV 8s, MERV 13s, but I can tell you all about it now. You know, I feel like I have a semi Dr. MacArthur Jackson, a semi-medical degree um, <laughs> at this point um, because we wanted to make sure we had filters in our schools that can filter out viruses. Um, and we sent our school students back to school um, in January. Uh, we have worked with them in a hybrid and a um, in a hybrid environment where they're learning remotely and in person. Um, and we're doing the best that we can during this time. But I think what's really important um, and of note is that we ensure that our kids are still being kids. They're having opportunities to socialize with one another. They're having opportunities to catch up on their literacy, their math, and all of those wonderful things, and recognizing that we have to manage our own expectation as educators because we are still living in a pandemic. So I'll stop there and let some of the other um, panelists respond. Oh, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what had been going on with Hamden. And that is a big question because we're talking about, like you said, 11 months, just about 12 months of activity. So of course it hit us uh, really uh, out of the blue. We were just going through our whole budget season. Uh, we had been flat funded uh, for our budget. So, you know, especially the Board of Ed and Superintendent, we were a little tight about that because we didn't have the kind of fun funding that we needed to do all of the initiatives that we had set out and then to have the pandemic come. And, and now we have different kinds of um, uh, needs. So we had to shift so much of what we had been planning for the following year and actually shift uh, before the end of, of that academic year. Um, so uh, everyone, of course, went home 
uh, we didn't know what to do. So uh, trying to transition to an online learning um, uh, uh, strategy um, was uh, very difficult. And you know, a lot of the administrators, teachers, uh, staff in general were putting in numerous hours to try to make this happen. So some of what happened in Hamden was that we were able to um, make sure that all students had uh, computers and iPads so that they could uh, receive their lessons online. Of course, an issue that comes up is connectivity. So we had to then make sure that we had hotspots. And so again, all of this is extra money. So we had to find grants and donations um, and shift uh, different line items in the budget to make that happen. Um, but then of course, if you switch to that kind of teaching, then the teachers had to then become prepared. So the teachers had to have a lot of professional development in order to learn how to teach online. And so I think that that's something that sometimes is, is looked over, which is that you can't just say, oh, you're a teacher, so therefore you should know how to teach in this different platform. It's a totally different, uh, uh, it's a totally different baby. Uh, you know, I, as, I, as I mentioned in my introduction, I was teaching um, with Gateway, the Gateway to College um, program, uh, which is a program with New Haven and Gateway College. And so when we had, uh, when we started to do the hybrid model, trying to teach online and have some students at home, it is really a struggle. And we didn't even get to that until this year. So uh, during the summer, there was a lot of work that was going on. Um, and before the summer, some of, a lot of that work began, but the summer was the time uh, that the PD continued the professional development, um, switching things over. Another issue uh, that came up was the whole issue of food security. So a lot of students were depending, families were depending on the schools to provide lunch for their students. So again, with Hamden, we were giving out lunches um, and then we also started to give out lunches and also food for the weekend as well. And that's continuing, it's, it, that continues. So, you know, because school is so central to the lives of our kids and to our community, there's a lot of, there's a lot of services that are, uh, it's not just in the classroom that the schools had been providing that we now had to provide in a different kind of way. And I'll just mention one other thing is that the education that we were giving, especially to students with special needs, um, it became another large issue when we started to um, uh, go online, right? So when we have a, a hybrid or a fully remote, and those were the choices that um, our students in Hamden, uh, those are the choices for families is that your student could come a hybrid model or could come as the uh, a remote learning. And both of those uh, models are difficult for especially for students with special needs, um, uh, students with IEPs and um, so, um, so we've been doing that work right now. Um, there are definitely challenges we just had, um, and we'll probably get into this later with another question, but we are starting to collect data about uh, distance learning and the effect of that, uh, the distance learning versus the hybrid model. And I'll talk more about that later. Thanks. All right, super great, great answers, guys. You guys actually touched upon quite a few. So for the essence of time, for, for each question, we're gonna go about two minutes each because we have a long, agenda to get through today. Um, so Dr. Tomiko Jackson, so as a mother, a pediatrician and a board member for the New Haven Public Schools, what are some of the ways you're supporting children and families? I wanna apologize for the distraction earlier. When you get home, I've been, home, I've been going all day, so the children are asking me questions. So if you see me looking this way and that way, it's either the kids or the puppy. So I'm sorry, I am paying attention. Um, you know, as a community advocate for health and um, wellness, I find that my, my role has been for advocacy and information. So what I've been doing is um, taking the information that I know and being that conduit so that my families who are, I would say 90% of my families are New Haven Public School families, uh, making sure they understand what's going on. Simply what is, Dr. Jackson, what's going on? Dr. Jackson, should I get the vaccine? Dr. Jackson, should I send my child back for hybrid? And the thing that I have been um, very um, intentional around is supplying clean and clear information so that families can make a choice. But what's important about making these decisions with COVID is that they're very personal. 
Um, they, they, they are a reflection of your home culture and your home beliefs. So when you make those decisions, like I tell all my parents, I want you to make it on facts, not on urban myths, what your cousin's neighbor said or anything like that. And so that's how I have been um, really using what I've been given as um, knowledge and also trying to decipher what, you know, what the Keisha Reds are, Hannah's are doing for the families. Because a lot of this is very technical. Um, as she said, she's got a degree in facilities management now around MERV 13 filters. You know, I didn't know anything about that either. Um, and just the, you know, teaching is technical. You just can't get up there and, and teach somebody. I mean, I teach on a different level. I teach medical students. I teach, I teach residents. That's a whole different ball game than sitting there trying to understand how to, you know, give knowledge to a nine-year-old through a, a device. So what I've been doing is using my talents to, to communicate to the community in a way that they understand so they, they can make educated um, decisions around things as simple as, should I go to the grocery store? Things as complicated as, Dr. Jackson, should I send my children back to school? So that's what I'm doing and how I'm trying to make um, a difference. Thank you. So a lot of people have questions, a lot of people's nerves, well, should I send my child back to school? And everybody wants to know from district to district, what is the protocol if a child tests positive? How's that information shared? I can speak to the medical side. So medically, you know, all of these students are gonna come through a medical provider. For the most part, the students are going to go through, the most reliable testing is when you go through Yale. So Yale has all these different testing sites and um, we refer them to Yale and Yale gives them the, the appointment. When they get tested and the test comes back, it's communicated, it's supposed to be communicated by the parent. It cannot be communicated by anyone else because of HIPAA. Keisha Red Hands can't call me and say, Tamiko, we know that, you know, Jim Bob went and got a test. Now you need to let me know what they have. I can't do that. We cannot disclose that. Even the only way, the only people that it gets disclosed to, it gets disclosed to the health department, but it, then it's de-identified too. You know, the, 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 main, the main file is de-identified. They're gonna call certain people to track where the where the infection is, but all of that is de-identified. We're relying on the community to come together and inform who they're supposed to inform. And that's how we're really gonna really work to contain the spread is people being honest about, you know, my husband is positive, my child may have tested positive. I'm not positive, but I still can't go to work. I still need to let my job know that I'm now out and I should not be going to the grocery. I should be home. And that was one of the things that as um, Keisha Red Hannons could, could say, I've been a real proponent around what are we doing to help families manage quarantining also? Mm -hmm. um, are we, the food that we're passing out that um, Miss Roxana was, speaking about because we're very much relied upon for um, breakfast and lunch. And we also have a supper program. How are we getting that to them? We can't expect them to come out and get it because that's breaking quarantine. So um, it's the communication is very private. It happens, it starts at the medical office and we're hoping that the folks that do test positive are communicating that forward to the places that, that, that um, where they go. And then once it gets to the school system, Keisha Red Hannons could take that over. <laughs> so I've been on both ends, right? I, I mentioned earlier that I have two school-age children um, in Hamden, um, as well as my position in New Haven Public Schools. So I've been on the end where, yes, we're contacted, we're told there's a confirmed positive case. Uh, when there's a confirmed positive case, uh, we notify the entire school community. Um, and that includes the staff um, and the students. Uh, we also have a dashboard on our uh, website that will let you inform you of the current number of cases 
of positive cases within our schools, um, as well as the cases to date from when we opened our doors on January 19th. Um, so as far as information flow, it's really important that we notify the school community to let you know there's a positive case. Those who have been con um, who are deemed to quarantine, we have contacted them, either the principal or the health department. Um, and so we notify the school community that way. But I've also been on the receiving end. Um, Hamden has done a great job of letting us know when there's a case within their schools. And they follow the same regulations as well. Um, that I described in New Haven. Um, and this comes from our Connecticut State Department of Education. Uh, they have informed us of how we are to inform our families. Um, and we're closely working with our health department. Um, so as Dr. Jackson MacArthur is explaining the health aspect of it, we as educators, we're just educators, right? We can't do this work without our local health department. And so any decisions that are made, it's in conjunction with our health department. Thank you. And that brings me to um, a next question. So what are some of the things um, as a school district and or schools that you guys have implemented to ensure the safety and well-being of the students, the teachers and their families? Like what is what does a classroom makeup look like? What does that look like? How many students are in a classroom and what is like a day-to-day -day um, routine for the children coming into the schools? Um, so for, for our students, um, you know, we're maintaining six feet distance um, all the time, whether we're in the classroom, whether we're in the hallways, um, whether we're in the gymnasium. Um, so desks are six feet apart. They have been measured. Uh, you will notice when you walk into schools, uh, signs and arrows that point to the direction that kids are to go. Um, you will also notice uh, numerous signs around the importance of hand washing, um, mask wearing, those things are important. I often laugh sometimes, um, I go into some of our local businesses and I see New Haven Public School signs in those businesses. And I'm okay with it because if it's keeping our community safe, it is a great thing um, for us. So, you, so schools do look different. Um, as far as class size, uh, you probably won't notice any more than 12 kids um, in, a, in a particular classroom. Uh, and that's why we've implemented hybrid schedules. Uh, so that some kids come on two days a week, Monday and Tuesday, some Thursday and Friday. You have other school systems where some kids are coming four days a week. We do the same as well. Um, and you have kids in different areas, but all desks are six feet apart. And mask wearing, you know, many parents thought that you couldn't get a kindergarten kid to wear a mask or a first grade kid to wear a mask all day. I have a five-year-old at home. That is not an issue or concern at all. I've been in schools and the kids are wearing their masks. They understand, as I explained to my child, there's a bad virus out there. So this mask keeps us safe. Um, and if you talk to them in lang language that they can understand, that they can grasp, um, they'll understand why it's important. And, and I, I will have to you know, say kudos to the schools um, on ensuring that when kids arrived in schools, they talked about the virus. They talked about germs. They talked about why it was important to constantly wash your hands, what mass breaks looks like. So I just wanna hear uh, uh, Roxanna, I know she's in Hamden on the board of ed. My kids are at Dunbar, Dunbar Hill School. They've done a great job. So I just wanna shout them out. Thank you. So Ms. Roxanna, how are things going in the Hamden Public Schools? What are some of the precautions you guys are taking to ensure the safety of children, students and their families? Right. I think that we're doing a really good job, you know, considering, you know, the, the task ahead of us. Um, we are d doing pretty much what um, uh, Keisha said, too, is just in terms of maintaining that six feet apart, maintaining the hand washing, uh, the use of sanitizer, um, wearing of masks, uh, uh, also the cl cleaning, you know, regular cleaning of the schools. Um, it also flows into uh, the sporting events and the organizations because some of those things are still going on, um, but, but there are precautions that are taken with those as well. So um, I think it's, it's a concerted effort. Um, I think parents are doing a great job making sure that they report 
um, when, when uh, family members or if there's any kind of contact with COVID. Um, I think we're doing a good job talking about it. I think that's a big part of it is having these community conversations at Board of Education meetings. Everybody doesn't agree, but I think that we come to a conclusion that we still you know, uh, make sure that safety is at you know, the, the center of it. But one thing that's really, I think, uh, interesting in some of the data that we're collecting is that, um, and I'm just kind of looking at some of this, which is that in our high school, 66% of the students are now distance learners. So you can imagine now that within the actual building, we have fewer students. So it's easier to maintain that distance. And it's also uh, broken up into uh, cohort A and cohort B. So cohort, cohort, cohort A, each cohort comes two times a week and then they're at home the other two days. So you can see that um, a big, there's not as many students in the building. And so that ideal of density, um, making sure it's not a, the density of, of uh, the population within the school at any given moment is much less than it had, you know, than it usually is um, in terms of the middle school. And I don't have the numbers for the um, right in front of me for the elementary schools, but for the middle school, which runs like high school, which is again, you have uh, a cohort A and cohort B, and they come two times a, um, uh, two, two times a week, but we only have, um, uh, sorry, let me see this for the middle school, we have, um, it's almost 50, it's almost 50% in um, as distance, completely distance learners. And it's a little more distance learners. So it's a little over 50% distance learners. So that's a, that's a big um, uh, part of helping to keep uh, the, the um, uh, keep on our kids and the, the staff safe as well. Awesome. So we do have a question in the chat pertaining to some of the precautions that we're talking. Um, so Mykeisha, would like to read that question? Sure. How do you ensure six feet distance when students are in the hallway? There are markings in our hallways um, to let students know what spot to stand on. So imagine if you're in a grocery store and they tell you to stand here. We have the same thing uh, within our hallways. Um, as well. And um, kids, you know, normally when you start a school year, you go through routines, you tell, teach kids how to walk through the hallways, how to do certain, um, uh, how do you turn your homework in when you walk, arrive to class, just certain normal routines and rituals. Well, we did that as well when we started um, school. And so they're very familiar with where to stand, where to go. Um, and so it's, it's been working for us. Um, so we're very, very proud of our protocols in place. Awesome. Sounds like such a I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Task. So, um, so uh, Ms. Roxanne had talked about the concerted efforts and the partnerships and not being able to do this for, without the parents. So I want to frame my next question for the parents. So we have Ms. Tracy Foskey. So we have been in the COVID-19 pandemic since March 2020. Can you discuss what challenges have been experienced by both parents and maybe your child at home? And how have you worked through those challenges? For myself, speaking for myself, it, it was tough for me in the beginning. I have a child that's on the spectrum and change if if he's not prepared for it, it's, it's not good. So um, initially he, um, from March up until June, he would not go online to engage in his services. And so what I did do is work with his team. He has a great support staff at um, New Haven Academy and they sent home his work and we were able to work through that. And he was able to meet with them one-on-one -on -one, but he wouldn't go on. And so when over the summer, when they were talk, where there were talks of the children going back to school, I didn't have that conversation with him because I didn't know if they were going back or if they were gonna still be home. And I'm glad I didn't because he was prepared to be home. However, his staff worked with him over the summer and he was able to engage remotely and he's been doing well. Um, there are times where it's just too much for him and you know they allow him to take those breaks. So I must say for him, that's been good, but in the beginning it was a lot stressful for me. And so at that time, what I had to do was rely on his mental health providers to come in and work with him on that, to process that with him as well as myself. Thank you. And You're welcome. And Mrs. Joyner, um, I believe you said that your children go to North Haven Public Schools? Yes. So what are, what are some of the things that you've been doing to support your children during this time? Well, actually, I do not have my children in school, so they're home um, studying remote. Um, but I have to say that um, 
Total Joy RU have been a great asset, not only to my family, but for the community. And so that's where we come in Total Joy RU. We're providing that support system for the parents and for those who have special needs. Um, and Tracy can actually include some of the, and explain more about some of the events. We have a really great um, team of people um, and some of them are on this call right now that has provided services for um, the parents and for the kids, such as having someone come in and explain to parents about what is an IEP and what are some of your rights as a parent, because it's overwhelming. And how does that look virtually now? And so this is where Total Joy comes in. Total Joy RU comes in where we provide that support system for parents and for the students. Um, and so Tracy has been doing a phenomenal job of incorporating um, more activities, but also educational support. And so as they're transitioning back into the school, um, a lot of parents just had a lot of questions, but they felt more comfortable asking Tracy, asking the support group of, I don't know what to do. I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. And that's where Total Joy RU comes in and we provide and kind of um, direct them to the right resources. We love the support services. We're actually going to talk about some support services. We're going to share collaboratively. We're going to support each other tonight during this call. We have a lot of great questions in the chat. Um, let's get to a few of them. My nephew didn't like school before COVID. He hasn't been in the building since March. I know he is behind. What are the plans to try to help close the gap? I think that's a um, great question. And I bet you if you poll uh, all of us, probably half of us fall into that category, right? Um, so the federal government has um, granted us uh, some what we call ESSER II funds. Um, this is the elementary and secondary schools emergency relief funds. You may hear folks refer to it as CARES Act II, coronavirus funds, um, whatever the name is. Um, and so all districts are receiving some level of funding. Um, and this funding can be utilized for learning recovery, learning acceleration, the digital divide. So I would, if we're talking about action steps and I'm, I'm not sure if we're there yet, I would inquire with your school system, you know, how are they leveraging these funds to support your children, right? Um, how is it going to help your child? Um, they've been out of school, let's say, Laquita mentioned, you know, her children are not in school right now. Tracy talked about my baby boy. She knows I love her son, um, you know, and, and some of the struggles that he's having. How can these funds be leveraged um, to help your children? Um, and what services are they providing uh, for our children? I would ask about those funds. They're in every single school system. Um, I can tell you in New Haven Public Schools, just real quickly, um, we have a, a huge effort going on to ensure that we have community input. Uh, on how we should leverage our funds. We've, we've taught, we have focus groups going on with all of our stakeholders, internal and external. We've spoken to over 500 staff members. We held a parent and community focus group last night with 60 people. We have three more planned, um, as well as planning committee uh, with 90 people um, to just plan out how to leverage these funds. So that would be the way I would tell, I would advise um, you to speak to your child's school system, speak to the principal, speak to the superintendent, whoever you can grab and ask them how they're leveraging those funds. Awesome. So we're going to take another question from the chat. What are the unique things being considered to keep older students, so our students who are in high school, safe and able to return to the buildings? So, and, and I think Roxana kind of alluded to it a little earlier when she talked about high schools and, and the middle schools in Hamden. Um, and, you know, uh, the return rate on the students actually coming in person um, in, most, in most school systems, you're about 50%, uh, which means we, we put them in cohorts, um, which means some of them attend school 
uh, let's say Monday, Tuesday, others may attend school Thursday, Friday. So just two days a week. So if you can imagine, you take 50% of your population and now you split them out into these cohorts. Technically you have 25% coming two days a week and another 25% coming another two days a week. And so that's how we're able to minimize the, the physical distancing of, of students, um, minimize the spread of COVID within our schools, because we know in high schools, it's individualized schedules, right? They're not moving as a class. And in many middle schools, they're not doing that either. Um, it's based upon what's their interest at the time, what is their academic levels as well. And so um, it's important that we follow that cohort model within our schools to keep our students safe. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about more about the the emotional um, piece that our our that our our students are facing. You know, it's no secret. A lot of our children in our in the public schools experience some form of mental health, right? So prior to us going um, distance learning and remote learning, um, we had support services in the schools. So have you seen an increase in um, the ch in the children's um, engagement in the classroom? What are some ways we're meeting their, um, their emotional needs uh, this, in this virtual space? Yeah, I know in Hamden again, uh, which is, I think this is uh, helping us to understand what's going on is by doing a number of surveys and then using that, those, uh, that data to inform how we move forward. So uh, some of the, the, the money from this CARES Act too, right? Uh, that we're going to be using some of this money to um, engage in some, some things that are going to help the students get back on track. Uh, we, had, we found that a number of students, wait, a lot more students were failing courses. Uh, seniors are failing courses. So the, the ideal of not being able to graduate uh, what, what, what do we do? How do we get, uh, you know, credit recovery? And then also for the juniors and um, sophomores. So, you know, we were having discussions about whether we have summer school and of course students are not going to want that. Um, we've also, and also with that, we're, we're finding uh, with the surveys that we're giving what the students are thinking. And so some of the, um, some of these social and emotional concerns that we've seen this year are uh, the loss of family members, um, increase in depression and anxiety and self-harm attempts. Um, hospitalizations, um, parent, parents and guardians are losing their jobs, financial hardships, and these things are, are impacting our students, you know, um, loss of homes, and of course the social isolation is a big piece. Um, students are acting as caretakers for their younger siblings, um, and some of the things that some of the students have said, um, uh, I'll just say a couple of uh, the, the comments. Some students are saying there's really nothing good about learning through Zoom, um, what's difficult about uh, uh, the situation we're in is not being in school, difficulty staying focused, um, having a hard time staying, staying focused, um, isolation, missing my friends. And so for young people, and I, I guess for us too, right? For older people, these are some of the issues we're facing, but you can imagine for the young folks. So going back, uh, it's not just the physical safety, it's not just the safety about you know, returning and not being harmed physically by COVID, but it's just the, the return and, and knowing that we're going to have to address these uh, emotional issues. Thank you. So there is evidence in our literature that children with special needs and autism and their families are likely to be at a greater risk to experience poor mental health and to be under greater pressure and less um, the less vulnerable families during the COVID-19. So um, Mrs. Joyner talked about some support services that can be provided to families. What are some ways that um, so what are some ways that families can access these services, whether their child is um, already identified having social and emotional needs or and or looking for their child to be supported during this time? Because it's challenging for everyone. You going to go, Tracy, or I'll go? I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can speak with your pediatrician who could actually help you. I mean, if you have that support system already at the school, you could follow up with them. Um, I, for the most part, my son already had his um, services in place and some of them had we had closed out, but we had to revisit based on the pandemic. And 
you have total joy are you if you're not aware where to go contact me and i could lead you in that direction with hopes of getting you the services that you and your child need i do know for my son um for stress and his anxiety i put boxing in his schedule and he enjoys it it really does help with focusing anxiety it has been a big help for my household really it has because I don't let him go anywhere based on a pandemic and everyone is not taking the proper steps and I just can't have him out there coming back home. I have my 68 year old mother who lives in the home with me and she has underlying issues and we just can't afford to take that risk. And also I like to include that um, for parents who have kids on, you know, have special needs um, kids that there's a lot of stress because now they're home and a lot of parents are not, um, don't have the skill set. I mean, I don't have this skill set. I didn't go to college for special education. That is a specialized um, skill. And anyone that works in special education, I'm like, God bless you. Uh, but a lot of those things, that's a lot of added stress for the parent of trying to be now the special ed teacher, um, teaching their child um, new new skills. And sometimes it could just be the basic things, um, just trying to meet up to those expectations. And that definitely put on a lot of stress on the parents. And then in return, you know, the stress also will be seen with the kids as well. So it's a lot of stress. And as Tracy has stated, having those resources in place for both the parents, because parents may feel guilty for saying, I need a break, or this is too much. Um, and you know, African American women, we typically say, I got this, and don't ask for help like they should. Um, but Tracy, um, Total Joy Are You can actually have those conversations with parents and with moms and dads saying, hey, you're not in it by yourself. And Tracy have done a phenomenal job working with a lot of parents in the New Haven community. Awesome. Dr. Tamiko Jackson, did you wanna add anything from a parent's perspective, uh, a medical perspective related to mental health with our children? Yes. Um, I have seen a sharp increase in just mental health complaints coming into the office and through virtual visits. I'm. What I would like to say is that the districts, and I'm glad to have, you know, we have New Haven represented as well as Hamden to really partner with the pediatricians in the community because we're the ones that parents are seeking out even before they seek out the school system. Um, the school system may start to complain about behavioral issues and really it's um, anxiety around the pandemic, anxiety around losing a family member anxiety around worrying about their mom or dad who has to leave the house to go to work. Um, it is unbelievable the amount of stress that our students are taking in. So what I think should happen, and I say this all the time, the school system can't do everything. They, you know, they always need the assistance of the community and around mental health reaching out to the different mental health providers. And there are quite a few in the community that are excellent um, that can provide, honestly, and I say simple, simple therapeutic counseling. Not every anxiety is gonna need a pill. Not every anxiety needs, you know, admissions or anything, but they do need a properly trained professional to help them to navigate what they're feeling and to give them strategies um, around understanding that this is a natural and you know everyone is feeling a lot of the same things um, I'm seeing cutting I'm seeing insomnia overeating excessive weight gain um, insomnia but then also sleeping all the time loss of interest um, in school from children who we're just on it before the pandemic or even on it when, when we started doing um, virtual, but now the pandemic fatigue is just too much. So I, I really think that, you know, I don't know if it's with the Essers money, um, although I think that would be a great way to look at um, uh, taking care of the community through that in tapping community health, uh, mental health services. You know, look to see who's out there, provide that resource for the families 
you know, we have these five different places, you know, I'm sure your pediatrician could, could recommend you here, or here's the list itself. People just need to know where to go. Um, and they have to really self-refer when it comes to mental health also. So that's very important. If, if I can add um, to the conversation on this, um, you know, I held a student focus group around, around the grant. And during the conversation, the kids' number one acts was, we just want time to talk to one another. And that was telling to me, it was heartbreaking at the same time, that all they're asking for is time to be a kid, time to just laugh, joke, play with friends. Um, you know, so uh, I know many of you know, because you're your parents, you know, we've been having these remote learning days on, on, on days where it's snowing, right? The biggest joy came out of, I see you, Dr. MacArthur. The biggest joy came out of the other day, we did a surprise snow day. And kids and families were just so relieved because they are fatigued with screen time. They're tired of doing the work. They just want to be kids. And that includes our teenagers. And so we have to listen um, to our kids and only be, I'll add this to it because I know we have several educators on this call. We also have to take care of the mental health of our educators and staff. They have gone through a lot and they are living through a pandemic as well. They're concerned about their family members. They're concerned about their overall safety and well-being, their health. Um, and so we have to take care of them um, as well as we're living through this pandemic. So when we talk about how has COVID impacted the classroom, it's our students, it's our staff, and it's also our family. And so we have to figure out what are those wraparound services for all three stakeholders to help them to be successful. Can I add one thing, please? May I add just one more thing? Um, and, and, and just to pay, with parents when you're dealing with your children that are that are stressed out um and as a i'm speaking as a parent also some things that you wouldn't like stand for i'm saying indulge your child sometimes a little bit more than you would have before um you know they stay up a little bit later sometimes or they might want to just eat an ice cream or i mean just anything um those little things go a long way with your child um, it doesn't take much to really make them feel happy right now because things are so uncomfortable that in their home, if you can make them feel their best or feel the most comfortable and the most safe, strive to do that. And I think, and I find that sometimes, I find that all the time for me. And when I do those types of things, I also, I also feel better, you know, and it, it just makes things feel so comfortable. And you know that that is the safe place your house, your home, if, if, if that's possible. So, so many people are being affected by, by the COVID. Not only is it our students, it's our parents and our teachers. So one thing that was mentioned in the chat um, and also uh, another panelist mentioned the learning hubs. How effective do you think the learning hubs have been throughout this, uh, this COVID-19 experience? I, I'm a proponent for, for um, learning hubs. I don't think that they give anyone any extra edge, but I think that they um, give parents an option um, to have a specific bubble. I mean, throughout this whole pandemic, a lot of people are looking for those bubbles where they know that you know certain things are happening and it gives them some comfort. Um, this pandemic and learning is not a one size fits all. So that's why I know there are, some who feel that, well, if you could send your kid to a learning hub, why aren't you sending your kid to school? You know, because maybe I feel more comfortable in a learning hub. You know, my kids aren't in a learning hub. They're actually virtual at home. Um, but I do know people who are using learning hubs and they work for them. And we, we're, we're giving them those options. So um, I don't think they give people an extra edge. I think they give certain people a little more comfort um, around their child's virtual experience. So we're gonna take 
one more, a few more questions from the chat. How you, how can you leverage ESS ERS funds when the but the new budget flat funds ECS and ELL funding and excess costs for special education? It seems as though the governor is planning to use the extra um, federal funds for from COVID to cover planned increases in the state funding, the new state budget. Great question. And I saw the question from Erin uh, when she put it in the chat. Yes. So this is a huge problem for us right now. Right. So the federal government is giving us these funds because they recognize they, they're, that there's been a lot of learning loss that has taken place, right? It was a recent report, uh, Roxana alluded to it earlier around the data, around um, how our kids are being impacted in remote learning environments. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little later, um, but it's negatively impacting our kids. So here's the federal government stepping up saying, we're gonna give you some extra funds. We recognize you've been crisis teaching and crisis leading here are some funds for you. Well, then the governor proposes a budget where there it was agreed upon that there was supposed to be over the uh, 10 years an increase because there were an equitable funds uh, given to urban districts. It's about 52 uh, in total, just urban districts and uh, 52 alliance districts, right? Inequitable funds for those districts. So what, what happened was uh, every year we're getting additional funds. So it happened for the first two years, this is over a 10 year period, this agreement. And now that we're getting these additional funds, the governor has said, well, you're getting these additional funds. We're gonna freeze this excess money that you were supposed to get from the state because you have these other funds and we're not gonna give it to you. And so there are a group of 52 superintendents who uh, you may have seen it in the register today. Uh, they wrote a letter saying, no, we need those the funding as well. Um, that funding helps us with our overall general fund. These ESSER funds are targeted to help us with specific target areas as a grant normally would. Um, and so we're asking people to advocate at the state level, contact your state delegation within your town, your city, um, let them know that we need these funds. And these funds, you know, New Haven Alumni Services, uh, New Haven and, and Hamden, these funds are directly impacting us, right? Because we were to receive those excess dollars that are being held up at this time. And it's not fair. And it, it, is, it is directly Im impacting urban environments. Um, and so we need the advocacy. So thank you, Aaron, for bringing, bringing that up. Right, it is so important, not just for the superintendents to, to make that plea, but parents, families, students need to contact their state reps, uh, state senators, uh, write letters, write letters to the governor uh, to make sure that we get that money because the, the ESSER money, that is the money that's going to help us with all of the issues that are, that are um, coming as a result of COVID. And, and if we were flat funded last year, we, we're still trying to make up for that money uh, for the next year. And so we just, you can't, how can you work on all of the initiatives that we've been planning to increase learning, to increase learning, to increase equity, all of those things, it, it all takes money. So, um, so, so we need parents, uh, community members uh, to, to definitely write letters, make calls um, and, and make sure that this, this uh, doesn't happen. And, and those monies can't be used for anything other than COVID related expenses. Like you can't balance anything. You can't go back and, and help out where you're needing. They're so limited. So, you know, even though we're getting all those millions of dollars, they are really, really restricted. So, you know, when we get flat funded and we're already in, in hand and two already underfunded districts, you know, it just continues to keep us in the hole. And, and, and so I'll give you a concrete example. Um, you know, pandemic hits. We rec in the private school sector. Uh, there was a there was an article um, that came out. I think it was about May around one wealthy district in Connecticut. How the first day, you know, pandemic hits, they give all their kids devices. All their kids one to one. They have laptops. They go home. Learning didn't stop for them. For our kids, 
it was a monumental effort just for us to get devices in our kids' hands because we weren't a one-to-one -one district, um, you know, pre-COVID. And so th this funding allows us to continue to be one-to-one. -one. And quite honestly, we're asking ourselves, should we be two-to-one? Should we allow kids to have devices at home and devices at school? So they're not carrying devices back and forth. Um, and so that comes with a lot of cost um, that we wouldn't normally have in our general fund budget. So even though you see this number in the ESSER two funds, that funding is going to be ate up pretty quickly, you know, if we make these decisions around technology. I think a parent mentioned earlier around uh, connectivity and how important that is, right? We uh, struck a deal with uh, Comcast where we have allowed connectivity in our homes uh, for families for one year. Well, we're, we're coming up on that one year mark. So what do we do for the following year? All of these things come at a cost. Um, and these aren't normal costs that we would normally incur if it wasn't a pandemic. So although you may see the numbers and you see, oh, you know, New Haven Public Schools, they're getting $37.8 million. Yes, it's allowing us to do some things, but we have to take care of the bare essentials as well. So we need that additional ECS funding um, and we just ask everyone, you know, righteous state legislators, uh, it's important. Yes, we definitely need to support that because our students, our teachers, and our districts deserve it. So we're going to take, we're going to have our next poll question. Sorry guys, I was on mute. All righty. All right, so we're gonna get into one more question out of the chat. The pandemic forced so many changes. Some of the changes may be things we want to continue even post pandemic. Can you highlight anything that we may want to maintain that we only started to do during the pandemic? So I think I mentioned earlier around the one-to-one -one, um, devices. Um, this is something that we are already um, working on a sustainability plan to ensure that that happens um, moving forward. Um, we also, I will also say, I think remote learning academies are will be here um, for a while. Um, some of our kids are really thriving in a remote learning environment um, and it's worked well. Uh, we've also found um, great ways and innovative ways to work with our students online. Um, and so breaking up what we would call normal direct instruction and, and allowing some independent um, instruction to occur online for students. Um, those are three things that rise to the top uh, for me, as, as far as as far as practices that we should continue to keep in place. I think the instruction, I think um, while teachers are still uh, learning more about the online platform, I think that um, it, it opens up the door for having a more creative way of approaching um, instruction. Um, where teachers now have a lot more resources that they can use to pull from. Um, and, and there are a lot of students who are finding that this is a, a better way for them to learn. And I, so, so I think what it can do is allow us to have a wider, a more diverse 
ideal about what education is and, and, and how students learn differently. You know, a lot of times we talk about learning differently when we talk about students who have special needs, but students in general have different learning styles. And this is, um, you know, giving us that opportunity to see this. Um, so we have like a number of students who have made high honors, uh, who are remote learners or who are in the hybrid mode. Um, so I think it's giving us this moment to um, just really question what, what education is. I think the other thing too is we're really um, in Hamden, um, our board of ed meetings and the meetings um, uh, with teachers and the professional development, I think that it's making us, it's pushing us to the limits, you know, it's put it, and, and making us go beyond the limits um, in terms of really talking about education and the, the, the inner, uh, I guess the, um, the connection between education and home life and uh, emotional uh, uh, development. So I think it's making us think about all of the issues that we were talking about before, but thinking about it uh, in more intense ways. You know, I, I, when we started doing um, virtual learning, online learning, for me, um, from the medical, medical aspects, I may peri periodically get a patient who may not be able to go to school for a physical issue, and they would have like this form of homebound now they don't really have to be like having a tutor that comes for a couple hours a day they lose connection with their friends now they really don't have to leave school there's a way to really stay engaged with every class almost the same way you're just not physically there but you might be, you might be able to see your teachers you'll see your friends i really think that this virtual learning has just changed the game on education forever um and i really as Ms. roxana has said Keisha has said, this is really going to make, is a game changer. Children are going to be able to stay engaged throughout a variety of different situations. I think this was the best thing that came out of um, this whole debacle of a, of a pandemic that um, in teaching our children. And uh, I, I think that that's a, a, a bright spot. No longer have that same homebound. See a kid for a couple hours and leave. No, no. This is that. I think that's the game changer. Okay, we have another question in the chat. Are both district parents organizations involved in the advocacy work around the freeze of ERS funds and ECS funds? So we're beginning, um, actually there's a budget meeting this evening um, to inform our, our community um, around what's happening with the ECS funds, uh, the ESSER the funds as well, because we do want our community to mobilize and advocate at the state level. Um, and so this is our, this is actually our second budget meeting um, with the actual community members. And so it is our hope that we can get others to advocate um, at the state level um, for the reinstatement of our ECS funds. I think this is a place where Hamden needs more work, right? In terms of engaging or, or making that place for the community to be part of the kind of advocacy we need. Um, I think too with with COVID because now that our board of ed meetings are on, online, the public comment comes in as as a you know as text. Like you write it and you don't get to read it because it's a webinar. And I think that makes a big difference. You know when 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 people can come face to face. I think that um, you know you have first of all you have well first of all I think we have more engagement in the sense that I think more parents come to meetings. But in terms of um, having that impact, uh, you know, I'm not sure if we're going, if we have, I think, I'm not sure if the board has yet created that um, space for that to happen in conjunction with one another. Um, you know, there's a space for parents to uh, make comments, but in terms of making those comments and then, and then actually working with parents and the community to, um, make the action that we need to happen and working in conjunction with the community to make that action happen. We need to work, we need to work on that a lot more. 
Well, hopefully tonight was a great start um, to, you know, collaborate with our teachers, parents, and communities to push what we need to do forward. So is there any closing remarks from any of our panelists tonight? I would, okay. I would just say that, uh, you know, we all have um, been strong through this, you know, uh, you know, praise God that we're all here today, you know, because people have died, you know, and um, people are still dying and people are suffering with all kinds of um, uh, issues after having COVID. Um, and then the other part of COVID is just, as we were talking about, the emotional strain. So my closing comment would be to, um, and I think that uh, Dr. Jackson MacArthur said, you know, have, have, you know, be lighter on our children, be lighter on one another. My daughter one day was talking about something her friend did. She said, you know what, I'm just going to have a little grace. And I said, you know what, that is great. And I think right now we need to have grace especially looking at our students in terms of what they're not doing, if they're not passing their classes, have a little grace, you know, we're, we're, we have this ideal of, oh, they're going to be behind. Behind what? Everybody's going to be behind. So that's going to kind of be the new normal and then we'll go from there. But, you know, we're getting out of this. Let's have that positive, um, you know, a positive attitude about getting out of it. And then when we get out of it, we'll address those things. But just let's have a little grace towards one another as we um, get out of this pandemic. I'd like to say um, that it's been a, it was just a pleasure on this, being on this panel with these wonderful women. Um, and in closing, I would like to just impress upon everyone that wearing your mask is fundamental. It's essential. I'm telling everyone the story that by this time I've seen so many influenza patients. I have not seen one influenza patient I have not seen one strep throat since April. So the masks work. Um, yes, you can still catch things if you're, you know, the mask isn't a hundred percent, but it's really, really high in preventing disease. And the one thing that we are really trying to pre prevent, even if you're vaccinated, I'm fully vaccinated and I'm still here folks. I'm fully vaccinated, I'm still here, um, is that, Wearing a mask is fundamental. Right now, please continue to wear your masks, continue to wash your hands, but continue to wear your mask because they work. And the more they work, the less virus that's spread, the less virus that is allowed to, to multiply. That means the least amount of um, um, strains. We don't wanna keep getting a lot of str different strains. So the more we prevent it from spreading, the more we will prevent different strains. So please mask up. I would just um, like to also say thank you um, to the ladies at Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated New Haven Alumni Chapter um, for putting together such an awesome panel of folks. I'm, I'm just humbled uh, to be in the few uh, amongst, amongst this strong group of women. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone, right? Thank you for the job that you all have been doing thus far. It has not been easy on any of us through this pandemic. Uh, those of you with children, uh, we know you want to pull your hair out sometime. I'm with you. Um, but thank you. I think Roxana says the best on giving grace. Uh, but know that you've done an awesome job. And sometimes we um, don't hear that enough as far as the job that we're doing day in, day out to keep everyone in our household sane and safe. Um, so I just wanna thank all of you. I ask you that you continue to work with us if you are New Haven Public Schools parents, um, continue to work with us. You know, you have questions, contact us, let us know what the questions are, let us help um, find a resolution um, for you. But I want you to go to sleep knowing that you've done a great job thus far. None of us were ever prepared to be in a pandemic and we're gonna be all right on the other side of this. So thank you for all that you've done. I just wanna say thank you for allowing me to sit on this platform with these wonderful women. Um, and just know that each one of us have our, our resources. I mean, if, and, and if you need it, we're here. Um, reach out to either one of us. We could help you or direct you to 
someone that was on this um, platform. Again, um, and take care of yourself, self-care. We as moms, um, we have to take care of ourselves in order to take care of our children. So for me, I've been walking every day since June 1st, and that's my time to myself. So once I get in the, get back home, I know that I have what I have to face, but you, you definitely have to make time for yourself. You def, it's definitely needed. So self-care is key. Thank you again. Thank you for the invite. I really appreciate everyone. And thank you for sharing uh, my advice to all the parents, be gentle with yourself. And if you know anyone that needs support, uh, specifically for autism, please um, contact Tracy Foskey, who's the founder of Total Joy RU. Uh, we are continuously working very hard of supporting the parents um, that are in the greater New Haven area. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful event tonight. It is a pleasure to be amongst you. So next, I'm going to kick it over to um, Ms. Loretha Tolson, who's going to do our call to action. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here tonight. I just wanted to thank all of our um, guests uh, this evening for a wonderful conversation. The chat was very lively, wonderful questions. I learned so much myself um, being a part of this conversation tonight and listening to everyone. Um, I wanted to thank our moderator, um, Sora Alexandria Lawrence, for a wonderful job, as well as all of the um, amazing panelists tonight. Um, you all touched upon so many um, important aspects of what's been happening. I can't believe that it's been almost a year. You know, we get to mid-March, it's been a year. And I've been home, working from home for um, since the middle of March. My daughter's been um, doing online learning. She goes to St. Rita's um, and they, they didn't miss a beat. But that Friday, they said, okay, come pick up devices. And that Monday, they were online and she's been doing that since. Um, and they've re reopened. So she's in a classroom where there's about four or five of them that are online still. And she has classmates that are in the classroom. So they gave us that option. And um, as um, Tracy Foskey mentioned, you know, having um, older relatives that live in the home with you, um, my our store, my mother-in-law, um, Walterine Tolson lives with us. And so um, we want to make sure that she's protected. And I'm happy to say that she did get her first shot um, uh, a couple weeks, few weeks ago. And so she's due for her second one and all has been well. Um, and also my father is in his seventies and I, we wanted to make sure that our children could still see him on a regular basis. So we had to make that decision. So it's been a lot. So just talk hearing as a parent, being able to hear about the resources and, you know, knowing that I'm not alone and feeling like sometimes I need a break or sometimes I feel like oh my gosh am I being a bad parent or feeling like you know maybe I'm giving too much to work and not enough to them or too much to them and not enough to work um, just knowing that I'm not alone and as um, Sora Red Hannon said that you're doing a great job so that touched me in many ways um, what I will also like to do is commend our panelists for I, many of you who have attended our um, community conversations know that it's great for us to come together and share all this knowledge um, and at the end we like to have an action item right so we want to um, bring about change we want to mobilize we want to make a difference in the community that we serve. And um, I have to commend you all because you've already talked about what we wanted to talk about for our call to action. So um, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds, ESSER funds, um, is something that we wanted to raise tonight. And we wanted to, um, Sora Red Hannon's mentioned that there was a meeting already. There's going to be three more um, encouraging parents to get involved and to attend um, you know, the, the board meetings and um, get involved um, and advocate on the state level so that you can have a say in how these funds are being spent um, and um, how the school is using these funds. And I think it's amazing that, you know, there's a focus group in talking to the students about what they think the funds should be used for. So um, that that is our call to action this evening. We want everyone to get engaged and to educate yourselves more about um, what's the funds that are available uh, to your, you know, your children and these in their schools and talk to the principal, talk to administrators um, and get involved and go to the meetings as as well. So uh, thank you very much for attending tonight. We appreciate you. Um, we appreciate all of your support. Thank you so much. I just wanted to take this time to remind everyone to please keep complete our evaluation. Um, that's so important to us. 
as we continue to develop our programming. So if you can scan the QR code that you see here, um, in addition to that, we will post it in the chat so that way you can complete the evaluation. In addition, uh, we wanted to inform you that our next conversation will be held on March 24th. Um, the conversation will be in regards to continue to address um, voting, hashtag we can't rest. So if you can join us, um, you will be seeing our flyer soon in regards to that conversation. So if you can join us on March 24th for um, our next community conversation. At this time, I will have our um, Madam President. Hi, good evening, everyone. So I'm just gonna give you a few seconds just to complete the evaluation as well as mark your calendars for March 24th, 2021. We can't rest. So I'm pretty sure you all can have an idea of what this conversation will be about but we don't want to spoil it. So we just want you to join on March 24th at 6 p.m. Same time, same place. We're going to be via Zoom still. So please join us. And again, mark your calendars. So again, I'd like to thank you all for joining this evening's conversation. Here is our contact information. Please follow us on social media. Um, we tend to post all of our events on our Facebook, on our Instagram, on our website. So we encourage you to reach out to us if you have any additional social action items you would like us to highlight. The email address is socialaction at nhacdst.org. And again, thank you for joining in on the conversation. I see a couple of links have been posted in the chat. So please, I'll give a moment for you to collect those links as well. But I believe as you all heard throughout the conversation, it's going to take all of us, right? It's gonna take all of us to continue to move forward and just support each other. So know that we have each other to lean on. You have resources, you have all of our you know, information as far as we want to reach out to my Sora Red Hannons, my Sora Jackson MacArthur, Sora Foskey, Mrs. Um, Walker Canton. If you wanted to reach out to anyone, please, please, please know that we are available to assist and provide resources as well. So thank you again for joining us. I'm gonna leave this slide up. If you wanted to take any information down as well as I'll shoot back over to the evaluation slide as well. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good night.